Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It is episode eight of Kerbal School. It is also the penultimate episode of Kerbal School. This is the second last episode before this series ends, and we will be moving on to the new Kerbal University stream series, where we'll be doing some more high-level, difficult stuff using the full tick tree. And... I will obviously make a point of blowing up at least one rocket for Sniper's benefit. Hi, Rich. <laughs> Lovely to see you, as always. So, what do we want to look at tonight? One of the last big beginner skills out there, which is going interplanetary. Because going interplanetary comes with some new challenges. When you want to go to the moon, you can just launch at any time and then you just pick the right spot in your orbit and you go there. As long as you intersect, you're going to get there. Planets are a little more complicated because the planet you're on is moving around in its orbit, but the planet you're going to is moving around in their orbit. And at different times, it is a lot less energy to get between them than at other times. And you can't just fly straight between them. You need an orbit from around the sun Basically, you need to escape the gravitational influence of the planet you start from into an orbit around the sun and then get an orbit that intersects the orbit of the other planet at a time when it'll be there for the lowest amount of energy. Now, the maths of doing all this is really complicated and that's why you can't just or don't see interplanetary um, research missions just launched every day. You got to launch them at the right time. And when you go further out, you often end up um, with them being launched so that they actually make use of flying past multiple planets and get using the gravity from one to get to the other. The Voyagers, for example, do, did that. And we can't send another mission like Voyager for decades yet because that was a very rare occasion where Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune and Uranus were all lined up so that you could swing past all of them and use Jupiter's gravity to get to Saturn and Saturn's gravity to get to the next one and so on and so forth. So, all that is a really cool and interesting, and if you want to read up about it, it's fun, and the math behind it is complicated and awesome. But we're going to learn the simple way, because this is Kerbal School, and we're assuming you're a beginner. So, luckily, the game offers us some tools to make all this quite a lot easier. There are mods that do an even better job, but I'm deliberately not using them in this series, because um, there are, but there are built into the game job um, jobbies, and that accessible even to people on console so we're going to use those and the first one is the alarm clock which sits over here second arrow button for button from the right on the bottom if you go and create an alarm here the default is manual time alarm but there is also a planetary transfer window alarm so we can choose where we're going from which is Kerbin and where we're going to oh, we've got a contract to fly by Juna so let's select Juna and we can add an alarm that allows us to warp directly to a date where Kerbin and um, Juna are in good positions in their orbit. Now, ideally for these particular two planets, if you were trying to do it manually, you'd want a position where if you draw a line from Kerbin to the Sun and from the Sun to Juna, that should be about a 45 degree angle. Um, you could try eyeball that and if you... but. If you have the alarm to do it for you, use that. Hi, Mad Girl. How lovely of you to join us, too. I was telling everybody last week about the wonderful little Kerbal toys you made me and how awesome they are, and saying they should DM you if they wanted to get their hands on some, and then you weren't there, so. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> now you were. <laughs> and aren't they just so adorable? Oh, and the little helmets go off. She's a very talented person. So, we'll give it a minute while we wait to, for our warp to bring us to a suitable time. Luckily, in this game, it doesn't take time to actually build a rocket. Well, it takes you time, but it doesn't, time doesn't pass in the game while you're busy building. So, we can warp straight to the transfer window and go build ourselves a rocket for an interplanetary mission. Now... Interplanetary is also a little more expensive on the old Delta V budget. That's because, well, we're going quite far. Um, 
interplanetary missions, yeah, again, you can look up on your Delta B map. I should have mine handy here somewhere, but I think someone's moved it very annoyingly. Oh, wait, I think that's it. So we want to get to Juna. So we can see here from Kerbin to orbit, 3,400. 950 to escape um, from Kerbin's sphere of influence. So call that 4,400. It's always better to round up. From there, another, in perfect conditions, about 130 plus another 250 to low orbit. But we just want to do a flyby so we can go for just here and give ourselves a 500 meters per second buffer. So we want about a total of about 5,000 meters per second, but 3,500 of that is just to get to orbit. So what we're really interested in is what we need to get into orbit, which is just, a, let's say, to be safe between 1,500 and 2,000. And I always like to go over-engineered. I'd much rather have too much and too little. Now, if you're playing with require signal for control and comnet enabled, then you want strong antennas for interplanetary. Unfortunately, we don't have super strong ones. And I might have made a small mistake when I chose to invest some points in heavy rocketry instead of, say, unlocking one of the more advanced antennas, like that one which I don't quite have enough for. So in the interest of not holding up the stream, and since this is not a real playthrough, I'm going to cheat. Don't do this in your own game. Do this in your real games. But I'm just going to get us some more science so we can have some better antennas for an interplanetary mission. Um, because trying to get there on the HD5s, we will need a thousand of them. Uh, so. Science plus 100. There we go. And just find the right one. So that at least gives us this antenna which and this one, which is much better for the job. You might want to make sure you get enough unlocked. Now, if I had gone and done the moon version of the rover mission, we only did Menmas last time, that would have given us the science to do this, which is why I don't feel bad about it. But I skipped straight ahead to the next part in the series. So. Then, yeah, we'll need an antenna because this is an unmanned mission. We don't need a relay because it's not a relay mission. Okay, let's see. I would go for something like this. Maybe even a third one for appearance sake. Which lets me put this on nicely like so. Once we're out of Atmo and it's no longer a risk, we can neatly fold that out. That's beautiful. So. Let's put some science cards on here. We are going to another planet. There's lots of science to get there and along the way. So we will want to take our thermometer and our atmospheric pressure sensor. Later in the game, there are stuff like the gravity meter and such that you unlock, which are really nice for this. But early, when you do your first interplanetary, those are probably the ones you're going to take, and that's fine. We're going to want some solar panels so we can keep power. Because without power, we don't have signal. And a decent battery or two. So we can transmit. For the in However, I'm going to say that this will work nicer if said battery is... Ah. Over here. And then... We do this. So it looks like the battery is built into the framework we made here. I just think that looks nicer. Right. That's really much our payload. So, now let's worry about, let's give this a name. We'll call this our Juno flyby. You can go for nice creative names like Dessa does, like Intrepid and Explorer or whatever, or sometimes you just get descriptive. So, 
next thing we need to be able to move this vessel a long long way away now these tanks in the, these tanks are really lovely for such things because they're very lightweight there's also this which is a nice in this form factor which you can put at one of the smaller engines like this on let's see what that gives us almost 1200 meters per second of delta v just there but now if the downside of this one is you have to mark it mounted on something so in order to make it a little neater let's say we plop one this over here oh didn't connect put our tank here and then pop one of these on the side here it's about the same but if we were to take four of them that's plenty enough to get to where we're going isn't it and I'm uh, the alternative and that's why we always experiment a little and this is really up to you too we can do that which is a bit longish but it'll function gives us about the same result we don't really need 3000 though so let's see whether we take one off two five if we take two just over 2000 which is in theory enough with a margin of error um, we don't have an extra SAS we are uh, as an extra reaction wheel on this I'm just checking if we need one yes we've got one built in this is a light for rocket um, payload it should do and the reason we can get so much Delta V out of such a small um, payload or is out of such a small engine is because the payload we're moving is so lightweight Let's give it one more, just to be safe. If we have two five, then I'd rather have too much than too little, you know? We can't go and refuel it. So, select our antennas over here. Action group one, toggle those. And extend the solar panels on the same one. That should do nicely. We can put a decoupler underneath. Go to our payload part and select a 1.25 meter fairing so we can get this safely to orbit build a nice fairing around it like this which also conveniently takes care of the size change to the next size up of um, tanks because we don't really have as much of the we have these though that might not be a bad call Let's just see, because this is not such a big, this is a very light payload. We can probably get away with 1.25s only, and that'll be cheaper. That should be enough to get to orbit. As is, this rocket should pretty much be ready to go. Just need some, some wings on the bottom. Three, five. Even if we need a teeny bit from the top stage, we should be good. Now, the good news is we should already be at a transfer window, so we really just kind of need to leave. Okay, we'll save and launch. We based our Delta V on what the map said we needed. We add a transfer window. We've got some buffer, quite a bit in case um, this is not a perfect transfer window because transfer windows also come in different levels of good they're all good enough but not all great so SA is on throttle maxed set and launch Ooh, we seem to be having some sound issues let me fix that there we go I don't know if you guys were even uh, uh, picked up sound issues as well, but I had some. Let's just try to get our launch angle a little better. Because transfer windows are based on the assumption that you are going to be pretty equatorial in your launch point. So it's a good idea to match that. The actual launch here is nothing special. It's the same as we do all the time. 
we're just putting our little interplanetary probe into orbit right now. Because the first step to this to space is orbit around your own planet. Carl Sagan said, low Earth orbit is 90% of the way to anywhere. Yeah, that's a little science here we could have transmitted, but that would, but we only have a deployed antenna, so wouldn't work right now. It's fine. Rage, among other things, the stuff you get out of that mod pack are these pretty clouds, those beautiful oceans. It looks a lot more bland in the base game. Most of what's in the mod pack actually are is are visuals like that. But there are a couple of minor game tweaks. Like this one and a slightly different um, tech tree layout. Though that is not completely essential. This is not my most efficient um, launch. We are launching very steep. We want to get to about 100 so we can make up a little bit of what we've wasted there by tilting over. I don't think we're dangerously ineffective, but still, we were way too steep to be efficient. I, was, I wasn't properly paying attention. <laughs> and the alarm clock actually tells us that the perfect moment for, to leave is right now while we're in launch, so that's perfect. As we cross 50 kilometers in altitude, stage and deploy our fairing. No need to carry that weight around. Hit our action group to deploy our antennas and our solar panels. Basic little interplanetary probe, but it should do the job just fine. Not the most pretty or complex probe I've ever built, but this is the Kerbal School, not the Kerbal What's the Most Complex Stuff I Can Build series. That'll be Kerbal Anniversary, starting next week. <laughs> so for now, we just want to circularize. Yeah, we're going to need just a teeny bit of our final stage fuel to finish so orbiting, probably partly to make up for my less than perfect launch. <laughs> yeah, you told me, right? It's fine. I wasn't criticizing. I was just letting you know what's in it. Because I know you've been trying to find time to do it. Um, but... Luckily, that's not a crisis because we over budgeted, so we should be fine. And we don't need to worry about getting into orbit on the other side or anything. This is just a flyby. That'll be our next mission. So, once we get to burn now. We'll fire the engine. That's a nice, cheap finishing move. Okay. And now comes the next little tool I want to introduce you to. Now, you could try and figure out how to set up a maneuver node from here. that lets you get all the way so that once you escape, your next orbit will interject that. But the next tool the game gives us is this one here, the maneuver tool. This tool only becomes available when you re unlock the third level of the um, tracking station, which is why I made a point of doing that last week. So make sure you do that before you try to go in a planetary. It just makes things so much easier, especially if you're a beginner. So this is a, this and the um, alarm clock were actually done by the person who you made the popular mods that used to do this. Um, but honestly the mods are better than the built-in tools he made but we work with what's built in for this version so we select Juna as our target it gives us an estimated cost to circularize on the other side depending on how high we try to go but for now it also tells us it'll cost about a thousand meters per second to get there we got more than 150 percent of the requirements so we should be fine 
and because we launched at a transfer window we got a transfer within a few days if you don't this could easily have said a year from now i always suggest doing quick save before any warp that's more than a few minutes though because sometimes time warps can go crazy so let's warp to the burn now over here you can see from Kerbin's point of view we're just burning till we're escaping at a particular angle what's happening when we zoom out is that we're going to get a new orbit around the sun it's going to run all the way around here and intersect Juna all the way over there and as you can see like I described here's Kerbin there's the sun there's Juna roughly a 45 degree angle over there if you're trying to eyeball this, if you haven't unlocked the, the first heritage station, you're trying to do this manually, that's how you do it. But while I wouldn't advise it, I also wouldn't say don't go for it if you're gutsy. It's your choice. <laughs> My friend, you have a child who you hijack your laptop. That's what children do. They hijack our stuff and our time. It's a fine. Don't criticize yourself for that. <laughs> um, I have one. I know what they're like. So... With this information, you know the, the, the basic and the advanced version, but we're using the basic version here, which is easy. Go for the advanced stuff when you get more complete. Especially because every planet, the ideal angle is different. So you have to look it up every time, whereas this thing doesn't. But sometimes also, you kind of have to because the, like Drez, I've never been able to get it to give me a proper angle to Drez. It just doesn't seem to be able to manage it. Right, we should now be. Oh, and it conveniently let, can automatically create an alarm for you as well. Which is good if you're doing multiple missions at once, because you can have one waiting for its exact launch moment and be launching another and stuff at the. or, or, or steering another at the same time and such. It can get pretty cool. But I've deliberately stuck to one mission at a time here, because as a beginner, that's just a little easier to keep track of. That red suggests we've got two encounters. That's not unusual, but it normally suggests that we're going to have a flyby of a moon. It doesn't look like it. Oh, oh, I see what's happening. we got two orbits overlaid. One is the orbit that intersects, and the other is what will happen if we just let it go fly past, which is that we'll end up in this orbit over here. Okay, we're almost at burn time. And now we're burning. So, this is just like any other burn. The only difference is we are now burning so hard we're going to escape Kerbin's sphere of influence. So you're going to see our orbit's gear is going to grow until it breaks the circle and is no longer falling back because we're going too fast. We've reached Kerbin's escape velocity. At that point, we have an orbit that will take us out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and into a solar orbit. And then we just keep growing that until it's the specific one we want, which is when it hits this point. Now, let's just see. We want a tiny bit more. So we burn the last bit nice and slow so we don't overshoot because planetary burns are quite sensitive. Yes, you're, if you're hitting for, for Joule, that's easy. It's giant. But most of the time, you're hitting a target a very long way away. You want to be reasonably accurate. But now we can have a look, see? And we definitely got a flyby here. We can actually make that a little better. And here's the advantage the further away you are when you adjust an orbit, the cheaper it gets. So we're just going to. Oh. You can do it while you're still around Kerbin's Sphere of Influence, but that gets really difficult. So I suggest waiting to just warping outside of that until you are in orbit around the sun. Here we are. We got some some signs from here because we've never been in solar orbit before. Okay, and then just a little ahead of where we are, let's add a maneuver there. Nice and far from the planet where it's cheap to do maneuvers. And then let's have a look-see. 
when we've well focused view on the planet we can go see what our orbit's going to be like if we modify that so i think we can start with something like this yes that helps you always want to try and go around and hit uh, fly past an a, a planet that you're visiting in an east-west direction that way if you decide to do a capture um, its gravity will help you capture and that's cheaper and it also means that you can easily get into an equatorial orbit so if you start doing stuff like landers that want to um, meet back up with motherships and such it's easier if everything's in an equatorial orbit around a target because that way they're all close to each other Okay, so we just want to tweak this. We want to fly nice and close by, but not that close. That's in the atmosphere. Duna's atmosphere is about 50 kilometers. By the way, you can look this up for any planet in the tracking station or in the KSpedia tool. But that little tweak, now look at the difference here. When you uh, On this flyby, it was almost straight. On this one, it does this nice bend. Now, this is good if you want to get captured. Now, this is a flyby on the contract, so we're not going to bother. But it does have another advantage, which is that we're going to get some science from low, low Duna orbit as well. And it's, you good, it's a good habit to get into because it's also less likely that some miscalculation will make you lose an orbit if that orbit is nice and close. And for a teeny, tiny little burn, we get what we want. So tiny, in fact, that we're going to want to reduce our thrust so that and make it longer so we can actually achieve the goal because 0 0.4 seconds of burn is very hard even two is going to be tricky but at least that's feasible there we go six that's manageable i think okay finish our warp if you do this if you did the same thing after you entered Juno's sphere of influence that would be several hundred meters per second of delta v and it's very easy to work out why this is if you think of say you walk straight from your house to some mountain you see in the distance it might take you a day to get there now imagine you just turn a little bit tiny bit to your left and then do and then walk the same distance you're probably going to miss the mountain by a mile teeny tiny change when you're far away can have a huge effect at the other end of your journey And to miss the mountain entirely when you're almost at the mountain, you have to walk all the way around it. That requires a very big, very tiring extra step. Orbital mechanics is a lot like that. Well, we seem spot on in just a few seconds to be able to complete the last burn for our first interplanetary flyby mission. And then we'll keep going with the interplanetary missions and do some more complex ones like capture burns and such. Okay, burn has begun. We can watch as our new orbit moves to match the one we have. We overshot a teeny bit, but not too bad we can just find a marker and squeeze ourselves back you're almost never going to hit a, a burn like this perfectly it's too sensitive so you just get for as close as you can and you can tweak it when you're closer where it will yes cost more but also be easier there we go that's almost perfect might be slightly too low yeah we'll have to get it just above the atmosphere when we arrive but other than that we're fine actually the atmosphere is fun enough that flying through the top level like that might not be a bad thing we can get some atmospheric science so let's hit a quick save before we do this warp the rest of the way here and then we can switch focus back to ourselves with a tiled key or is it pronounced tilde I never quite figured that out. The key next to the left of the of the number one on the top row of the keyboard. <laughs> uh, 
And here you can see we've got a nice strong signal that's that green line. This here allows you to control how your signal is displayed. I like to, to keep it on two sets, which is PATH, shows you how, you how you connect it, but whatever works for you. We fill in free bar yellow signal as we reach a different planet, which is what would have been really hard if we hadn't had these antennas. We got some science as we arrive around Duna, which we can transmit back. And you can see this pressure scan was worth 60 science. They're like free on Kerbin because we're quite far away now. We're at a different planet and you get science bonuses the further away you are. So we can warp a little closer to go look for that low orbit science. We're going to hit the retrograde and the back of the rocket will point at the planet. I love the love this glow that the astronomer's visual pack gives Duna. Juna is Kerbin's analog of Mars, so it's red like Mars with polar ice caps. Unlike Mars, though, it doesn't have two teeny tiny moons. It's got one big one called Ike. Oops, I didn't want to burn here. So we'll just do a little fly. We should soon get some low orbit science. There we go. Let's mid those. Now we hopefully we won't. I'm actually thinking, let's play it safe. Once we get closer... Oh, no, we can't fold away our antennas, or... <laughs> if they get... If we do, we will lose control, so... Hopefully we can get some... Ah, we can get some atmospheric science, and hopefully our antennas survive. But if they don't, the probe's done its purpose. We're only at the very top edge of a very thin atmosphere, so we should be good. We ought to survive. Juno's atmosphere is quite thin. It's why you can't land on Juno with just parachutes. You kind of typically have to have rockets as well. Same thing with Mars and our solar system. That's why the rovers all used um, other things alongside the parachutes. Though I think nothing is more Kerbal in the history of real space flight than the first Mars rover, which they wrapped in giant balloons and dropped. It was basically, it was wrapped in... Essentially the same stuff that your car's airbag is made from, except like 30 of them all around. And it was just, it landed, the air parachute did what it could, it hit the ground, and it bounced like 20 times in those balloons before it stopped. And then they deflated the balloons and the rover was set free. It was actually a really cool thing. But they didn't do that again, because it was insane. <laughs> hey, it worked though. All right, we've lost signal now. Anybody have an idea why? And now we got it back. Can you figure out what happened? Come on, anybody, somebody in chat, tell me. Why did we lose signal and then get it back? We couldn't have lost power. We had power. We aren't further. We're further now than when we lost signal, so it's not distance. What happened? Any ideas? Just happened again as we passed behind the moon. Come on, give me a clue. Give me an answer. What do you think's happening? It's useful to know anyway. I don't know why I try to engage chat. <laughs> we had a planet between us and, a, and our home planet. Signals can't go through planets. They're line of sight. They can get through like the top layer of a planet roughly. Which is actually kind of realistic. In real life, they do that too. Not because they actually penetrate, but because they bounce off the ionospheres. But in in game, that's how that comes across. But you cannot when you we've got an entire planet between you and your home planet. You're not going to have signal. If you actually want full signal everywhere on Duna, you need to build a relay network around it. Anyway. Here we are. We have escaped Duna again. We have completed our flyby mission contract, I believe. Yep. So let's return to the space center. That whole process would have taken about a year and a half since we left.
Hmm, I just got a notification from NASA. Let's see what NASA has to say. Just out of interest. Oh, so live broadcast about the next steps into the James Webb Space Telescope's journey. I'm pretty familiar with what's going to happen there, so <laughs> that's fine. Oh, but look at this. Almost 350 points of science. So we're going to go unlock some interesting stuff with that. Um, like more fuel tanks. And probably get... Oh, a few of these we need to you need you at this point in the game you're really going to be having to make your own decisions about what your priorities are um personally i like to try and unlock the biggest antennas as early as possible but that's based on my play style uh, i like to that way you can go further with less hassle but I like this one also because it's available now. It gives us stronger antenna and gives us another science experiment, which unlocks more these things more easily. So let's grab that. That's a fun one to get. Eight. Now let's go see. We should have a whole bunch of new Duna related missions. Yes, we got one to orbit Duna. We're not going to try to land on it now. Don't think we have time to do that anyway. So, we could have pretty much done an orbit mission with the, with the vessel we had before. But let's tweak it a bit and build a version 2 for our orbiter that can do some new science while it, when it gets there. Now the magnetometer is lovely for this kind of work because the magnetometer has per biome science. You may have noticed we also unlocked this one, the seismic accelerometer. That's a lovely one, but that's only for landers because you have to be landed on the ground for it to work. So it's a waste to put it on a orbital mission. But there's something else we should consider doing since we're gonna be orbiting, which is to swap out these antennas we have stronger ones now, but that's not what I think we should swap them for. I think we should swap them for these. One of these, at least. That is the stronger relay antenna. And the reason is that turns this, once we're done doing science with it, into a relay. It's not a whole relay network, but having an extra relay means that sometimes even just with once, it'll mean sometimes we'll have signal where we otherwise wouldn't have. And it fits neatly on top of our little telescope. Now, it costs us almost a thousand meters per second of delta V because it's quite heavy. But the good news is we had more than a thousand more than we needed. Um, that I do think we will need a better... Um, surface um, launch stage to get there. We'll rename this to the Juno Orbiter. Right. Let's get rid of the old um, launch vehicle because it's not going to work. But we should also get to another um, launch window. Otherwise, this isn't going to function anyway. So let's just step out. Just go create an alarm. So Planetary transfer window from Kerbin to Juna. Add alarm. Warp next. So we got a slightly heavier probe this time because we added a relay sat to it, antenna to it. So we should give our slightly heavier probe a slightly better launch vehicle. But luckily we got plenty of um, power to do that with. It's also a little big for a 1.25 meter fairing. So let's step it up to the next one and build a 2.5 meter launch vehicle. Here's a little look-see for those who haven't seen it at the full um, range of the Kerbal Solar System. While we're waiting. 
from the, in the beginning we got Moho, Coben's version of of Mercury, followed by Eve, which is the Venus analog, and a lot like um, Venus, it's covered in a thick, sticky atmo. Coben, where we are, Juna, like the Mars analog, Drez, which I don't think is based on anything in our solar system. Jewel, which is based on Jupiter and Saturn, mostly Jupiter. And right out there, Elu, which is sort of vaguely based on Pluto. Alright, let's go finish our warp outside. Elo being by far the hardest one to um, plan to get to, but not by as big a margin as you'd think. Moho is, is actually the hardest one to orbit because it is so close to the sun. You need to burn off so much speed. That's kind of true of Mercury as well. When we send things to Mercury, we usually use a whole bunch of gravity assets. The first Mariner uh, mission to Mercury did free grab swing by from Venus, Earth, Venus, before it went to Mercury, using their gravity to slow itself down to an orbit that could orbit into, that could catch into Mercury with the fuel it had available. Um, the Russian Venera missions that similar, did a similar maneuver. The hardest one to take off from is Jules Moon um, Tylo which I'm sure when you play further on and you start exploring the Julian system, you will find that it's many mu It's got five moons and they're all unique and they all present their own challenges. Some are really easy and some are really hard. We got an ice moon, much like Europa, called Val. Tylo, which is based on Saturn's moon, um, Titan. But without the atmosphere that Titan has. And Leif, which has a breathable oxygenated atmosphere where jet engines work. So you can send a jet plane to Leif and fly it there. Something fun to do with you when you feel up to the challenge of sending a jet plane to another planet. Right. Enough nonsense talking. Time to pass. We have finished warping. So we select our bigger... Very. We don't actually have the 2.5 meters unlocked yet. We only have the 1.875s. Guess that's what we're using for the first. So let's do a two stager. We'll put one of these over here for an. Up, give it an upper stage. That's. Hmm. Let me see. Let me think. What engine should we put on this upper stage? The Bobcat. No, that's a ground launch vehicle. I think we want one of these, but if we're gonna use that, then we will want an engine plate, I think. Yes, then we'll go 2.5 meter underneath that, although this gets us almost all of the way there. Yeah, that would be overkill like that, so. Let's go for this version instead. We'll use that little adapter. We'll grab the skipper engine. Oof. That's way more than we actually need. Honestly, it's starting to look like we really should just go for straight up 1.8 meters here. Even though we don't have the best 1.8 meter, or the full length 1.8 meter unlocked yet. But if we just stick a couple of these on like this, stick the bobcat underneath. <laughs> That's actually way more than we need. We have three. That looks good. Okay. Let's auto strut this because it's especially important when you have a whole bunch of tanks stacked on top of each other like this. Otherwise, you tend to get wobbly. And we'll stick a launch clamp or two on it. Okay. That should do for an orbiter. That will also, once we're done collecting science with it, act as a relay and occasionally give us coverage that we would otherwise have lost signal. You know, because whenever you're behind, you know, you're not going to have signal. 
and that large relay has about the same coverage as two, the two antennas we had before it. Which is why I chose to unlock it so early. We're also launching with quite a big thrust to weight ratio, so we want to start a nice early um, tilt here. Follow prograde. Yep. One advantage of having a big, a strong thrust to rate ratio that's two plus, it's often more annoying and wasteful than it's worth, but it does mean that you have a very easy to steer rocket in the early part of the launch when you're dealing with the thick atmosphere. Being able to basically punch through it with brute force does make your rocket a little easier to, to keep pointed in the right direction. I don't know if Mr. Sniper is going to show up tonight, but if he is, I will blow something up for him. He does so love it when I do that. And who am I to disappoint my fans, right? Um, I feel like this should be, uh, we want to be going a lot flatter than this thing is. That's better. Sometimes you just got to, oops, and we're already at 117. Ah, uh, this thing is just forcing its way to orbit really fast. It's fine, we'll... We have enough Delta V to spare, so... Once we're in orbit, our... We should actually get some... Be able to get some science from our own... From our local magnetometer here. because we've never deployed one here either, so we'll pick some Kerbin science up with it before we leave. Right away, in fact, the first batch. It gets extended on a beam all the way to the distance. That's actually exactly like they work in real life. Oh, but interesting, we discovered a little issue. We don't have enough electric, enough battery on this thing to transmit the data from the magnetometer. Which suggests it's time for a minor redesign. Might as well just put more batteries on instead of that truss structure we used before. So hopefully we can actually transfer that science back. I we want to be able to 2018 so far. We might end up wanting to change our launch system. We'll see. 1845. Because we want to make sure we need to make sure we have enough to get captured as well. And we're not building something that can handle enough atmosphere to error break, so we need to design with enough to spare there probably is enough here but it can't hurt to have just a little extra just in case things don't go perfectly yeah that should be fine do we still fit no nope, we're gonna have to edit our fairing and now we have just about perf the perfect amount of delta v in the lower levels Let's give us, but we've got plenty of thrust to weight ratio. So let's give us a little bonus there too. So we don't need an absolutely perfect launch to have a successful launch. Because unlike the Ariane 5 launching that launched the JWST, we don't launch almost perfectly every time. And man, was that perfect. Doubling the life expectancy of the satellite with your perfect launch vehicle, that's insanely... Good. Nobody saw that coming. So well done, Isa, on that one. Every astronomer in the world thanks you. You've got the opportunity to collect so much more science than we thought we would be able to with that thing. Good use of taxpayer money, too.
Okay, so hold here for just a moment. This time we're definitely not too too steep. Gotta watch not to go too flat, in fact. Okay, we're over ten. We can start following progress again. This is certainly a more typical launch. Which is a little more efficient too. Yeah, we don't really go below 20 until we hit 30, 30 kilometers altitude. But we're about to anyway. Uh, 70, 80, 90, 100. Beautiful! So we can use some physical time warp. Remember that shift and full stop. Get past 50. Deploy our so, uh, panels and bearing. Just to be safe, though, let's circularize and then we'll worry about sites. Based on these numbers, we will actually have launch vehicle fuel left over after circularization. So we could use that for the transfer to Juno, or at least part of it. Which means we will definitely have enough to choose whatever orbit we want to be in there. It might not be a bad idea to then go for, for a polar orbit, so we can get science over every single pole. Oh, uh, biome. Uh, that's also often convenient for a so a singular relay, especially if you put in a nice high orbit afterwards to park. Because then it'll often be able to maintain signal back to Kerbin almost all the time, except when it's passing directly behind the planet. Okay, now we can do science. Since we have the auto drop out of warp on, we can just warp until it hits another dryer and it'll stop us. Yeah, now we can transmit all our science. <laughs> it also gets a little... Oh, it's... Per, oh, wait, this is not per planetary biome. This one is... Okay, I remembered wrong. It's space low and space high, but it's not every biome. There is experiments that's like that, like EVAs, but I forgot this is not one of them. Okay, in that case, let's plan our trip to Juno. We're going to do the exact same thing as before. We're going to use the maneuver generator. That's about a thousand again. Most of which we can get from what's left in our launch phase. We quite over-engineered this one, I'd say. So... Get ourselves on target. And time warp ahead. And now, if you're very confident in the system, you can do all this in gameplay view instead of map view. <laughs> I'm not that confident. I prefer to go to map view so I can see what it's going to do. And also, if you slightly overshoot or miss, then it's easier to tweak things from here. Uh, so that removes the scientific reason for a polar orbit, but there's still benefits to it other than that. So I think we might go for one anyway. We saw how to do a reasonably equatorial flyby before. So let's tweak ourselves to a polar orbit this time. 
and then and we've shown off two ways to deal with your arrival at a, at a different planet during this um, session as well as the easy way to get there in the first place one tip if you schedule one of these and they're very far in the future, which can happen, especially if you forgot to wait for a transfer window, then it'll probably give you a way too big number. Much bigger than the map says it should be. If that happens, just warp to the alarm that it created and then recreate it there. Delete the note, recreate it. And when you're close to the time, it'll be able to create, calculate a much cheaper, more efficient note. A little wobbly with the big heavy launch stage behind us, but nothing unmanageable. Though we started a few seconds late, that's a potentially a bigger issue. Hopefully not a critical one. I think we'll be okay. But we'll see once we actually reach escape and start pushing the orbit. I think we we may not have the exact in planned orbit, but we should still have an encounter. Or close enough that we can tweak to one. There we go, that's an encounter. Let's not push our luck then. We'll take the encounter we got. We'll get ourselves over the sun. Where there's some science to get. Okay. And we'll focus view on Juna. Okay. Oh, we forgot to create a maneuver. from now that's not bad okay so we'll start by using radial in to get closer now we want to be polar so we're not gonna push ourselves all the way through but we'll use the normal to bring ourselves to a close polar as we do we can see we're a little off a little too far in this direction so we'll undo some of that and we'll balance these two out with each other until we get a polar orbit nice and close to the planet like this. We're flying low over the poles. How high up is that? About 300. The atmosphere is only 50 high. So we're actually perfectly fine to go as close as 60. So that gravity of Duna can slow us down as much as possible. There we go. That's beautiful. And because gravity, Duna's gravity is slowing us down so much, means that slowdowns we don't have to do. We haven't even left Coven's sphere of influence yet. This is actually just how we're still in high space. We're going to do this. We'll make it a little easier. And then we're going to say a little quick save. We're going to warp to the maneuver node. It'll be a lot quicker to spin the rocket into the proper position now because we're no longer spinning that giant launch vehicle as well this is just a lightweight probe which is a lot easier to 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 aim and here we are with a little magnetometer data from across above the sun
and we're burning at a very tiny fraction of our total thrust capability but it makes this very delicate burn a lot easier to to control in fact we might have slightly overdone the thrust limiter but it's fine a little too much is better than a little too little there you can see how our expected orbit is getting closer and closer to our planned one There we go, spot on. Okay, let's restore our thrust. We're gonna need it. Do a quick save. And then we'll warp over here where we're gonna have some science to do first. How do you get captured around a different planet once so that you can enter orbit? Well, the opposite of how you escape from Kerbin, which is always mostly a prograde burn. You burn a bur you have to slow down till you are below Dunas escape velocity, which means you need to burn against the direction of the orbit so you get slower, and bur that means burning retrograde. And as we've learned, retrograde orbits always cheapest to do at periaps. So right here at our lowest point, this is where we're going to do our capture burn. And you can see how much the gravity is already slowing us down. How close? That's a whole lot of slow of the path towards closing the orbit that we don't have to do. That's already done for us. We just need to come do the last bit. But I think I hit the wrong button. I hit warp here. I was trying to say add maneuver. So we're planning a retrograde burn. Once it closes, that means we'll be in orbit. That's what we want. It'll be a nice high orbit at the apoapse. Initially with a very low periapse, but that's fine. It's very eccentric, but that's fine for now. We'll circularize it at the apoapse afterwards. Getting the close flyby also lets us get us the magnetometer um, data um, science from nearby. Oh, we had a little Duna Ike eclipse there. Or oh, Ike Shadow Pass. But it also gives us the cheapest capture. So we'll have lots of Delta V to um, establish our big polar orbit afterwards. Alright. 315 science right here. Just takes a little while to do this one because you it's got to wait for the beam to extend this is an experiment that exists in real life voyager one was one of the first probes to have one but there's been magnetometers on many um probes and they do really use extending beams like that that's because there's all sorts of magnetic fields being generated by the probe from the electronics and the batteries and even the sparks in the motors and stuff so by putting it a far away from the probe you reduce the amount of magnetic interference from the probe so you can measure the magnetic field of the thing of the, of the thing you're studying which is what those are for and we're in orbit that's a contract complete and besides just completing a contract we've got a nicely useful um, relay set now which can increase our ability to maintain signal here it could even mean we can send probes here with much smaller antennas Provided we do any correction burns while we're still close to Kerbin. Because they don't need enough of an antenna to reach all the way back to Kerbin. Just to get as far as the relay. That's one of the things that we really do in real life. Like the Mars rovers tend to have antennas that can reach Earth. But um, they don't all do. Some of them can only reach little orbiters that are around Mars. And a lot of them have antennas that can do both. So they'll talk directly to Earth when Earth is in view, but then they'll talk to the relays that we have around Mars when it's not. And considering Mars is populated by quite a large number of robots, their communication is what makes them useful to us.
and it's impossible to oh, we don't want to use them only when the right side of Mars is facing towards Earth. But luckily we got quite a few orbiting probes. And those not only act as relays, much like this one, they're also science instruments. They do various um, observations, like along with the recent Ingenuity rover and the helicopter one, we launched an orbiter that joined it, which is doing weather analysis from the top, but also acting as a relay. And when it's not talking to that, it's talking to the ESA relay around Mars. Or the Chinese one. Generally, space agencies are quite happy to share their relays for around other planets because they all benefit from, from, from sharing together this way. It means all of them have more coverage than any one of them could have achieved alone. And because we're nice and high, there's no risk that we're going to have an unplanned interaction with Ike in the future that's going to knock us out of orbit around Juno. We just have a relay that gives us quite a bit of coverage over here. And that, I think, is where we're going to call it tonight. Um, this is essentially the end of the interplanetary lesson. There's not much more I can teach you for, from a beginner point of view. Wednesday will be the final episode of the Kerbal School series. And it's a big special one. I'm going to teach you how to do Apollo-style crude landings. So you can recreate the way Neil Armstrong went to the real moon. So if you're keen on learning how to do that... That's what we'll be covering. So I'm going to be spending all this delicious science unlocking some of the parts we need. See you guys next week. Thank you for joining me.